If we contrast with the speech of this mind which is fully aware of its confused state, the speech of that simple consciousness of the true and the good, we find that in the face of the frank and self-conscious eloquence of the educated mind, it can be no more than taciturn. For to the latter it can say nothing that it does not already know and say. If it gets beyond speaking in monosyllables, it says therefore the same thing that is said by the educated mind but in doing so also commits the folly of imagining that it is saying something new and different. Its very words shameful, ignoble, are already this folly, for the other says them about itself. This latter mind perverts in its speech all that is unequivocal, because what is self-identical is only an abstraction, but in its actual existence is in its own self a perversion. The plain mind, on the other hand, takes under its protection the good and noble, that is, what retains its self-identity and its utterance, in the only way here possible. That is to say, the good does not lose its value because it may be associated or mixed with the bad, for this is its condition and necessity, and in this fact lies the wisdom of nature. Yet, this plain mind, while it imagined it was contradicting what was said, has, in doing so, merely condensed into a trivial form the content of spirit's utterance. In making the opposite of the noble and the good into the condition and necessity of the noble and the good, it thoughtlessly supposes itself to be saying something else than that which is called noble and good is, in its essence, the reverse of itself, or that, conversely, the bad is the excellent. Here in paragraph 523 and, and moving towards the end of this section about culture and alienation or rather self-alienation in culture, we're going to see a really interesting dynamic being noted, one that I think has a lot of contemporary applications as well as you know within the, the dialectic of history as Hegel is discussing it and probably also in his own time as well. And what Hegel's going to contrast here are two different consciousnesses, both of which are caught up within this alienating culture uh, whose, whose features we have now uncovered, at least in outline, through the, the previous paragraphs in this section. We saw that the noble and ignoble consciousness really can't be completely distinguished from each other. We saw that good and bad, there's this interpolarity <clears throat> going on between them that, you know, you might say transmutes the one into the other. The word that, that uh, Miller is using here is either perversion or inversion for care, right? We might actually, if we want to uh, be a little flippant with it, say that they're having intercourse with each other, right? Um, and then we also saw that state power and wealth, which now at this point have almost like completely vanished from the scene of the discourse, uh, except as, as the objects of witty talk uh, carried out on the part of a certain consciousness, um, those also were subject to it as well. And we, we saw that there was a what we might call the sophisticated consciousness. Uh, Miller's translation here is, um, you know, the mind which is fully aware of its confused state, its eloquent, self-conscious eloquence. But I think that we might use the word sophisticated or nuanced in, in the present about this, this sort of consciousness. And what it does is it takes in, uh, you know, not necessarily the totality, but at least uh, enough of it, enough of that poison pill to know that nothing is as simple as the words in the witty talk describing it make it out to be. Certainly not the, the true, the good, and the noble, right? Uh, that the, as Hegel's going to talk about it, a simple consciousness. This is the person who's been left behind in the culture, who feels unmoored in it. And, and this isn't just one single type of person. This is not, you know, somebody who's lacking in intelligence um, or somebody who simply was sheltered in their life. This could actually be the, the you know, form of the, uh, 
the sophisticated consciousness who said, Gee, I've had enough of this. We need something we can rely on, something that's, that's, that's straightforward, that is good, that's honest. That's another uh, word that we, we saw cropping up in this section. So there is this interesting conflict that is going on here. And Hegel is not actually unsympathetic to these, these demands or these expectations, but he thinks that they're going to founder. So let's see how this happens. He says, if we contrast the speech of this mind, that is the, the witty repartee, the, the discussion that ranges over everything, kind of a mixed medley, the, the speech of this mind, which is fully aware of its confused state, if we contrast with that, the speech of this, that simple consciousness of the true and the good, simple, einfach, you know, we might say straightforward. Uh, it only has one side, right? Um, the simple consciousness of the, the true and the good, which is able then to associate the true and the good with particular objects or turns them into ideals that are yet to be realized, but we feel in our heart. Notice that, I'm going to pause here for a moment. Notice that what's going on here is not something that is, that is totally new on the scene in the dialectic of the phenomenology of spirit. Where have we seen these sorts of appeals before? The law of the heart, right? Uh, virtue in the way of the world. Earlier in the, the reason section. Earlier, perhaps, in, in the spirit section in certain parts. We can go even further back into the self-consciousness section and think about what happened in the transition from the master-slave dialectic then into stoicism, skepticism, and the unhappy consciousness. This is similar in many respects to what Hegel had labeled uh, and was associating with the historical school movement way of life of Stoicism. There is a true, there is a good. Instead of saying the noble, he used the word rational there, right? And you know, counterposed to that, coming out of the very failure of that that state of consciousness was what Hegel was calling skepticism. And skepticism wasn't just a sort of standoffish, you know, uh, if we want to use Hume, sort of uh, uh, billiard hall, you know, uh, kind of, kind of uh, game that you play with yourself. No, it was aware of the self-contradiction of the culture that it was living in, of the entire world. The fact that the good, the true, the rational couldn't be you know, in a simple way associated with this or that, that everything was kind of mixed up together, that things were turning into their opposites or revealing the opposites within their very hearts, that the good was not wholly good, that the rational contained a seed of irrationality within it. And that consciousness itself was not able to sort of stand off against this as it itself, the true, the good, the rational, but was mixed in with this. It could not escape it. So we're seeing here a repetition, but now in terms of language, now in terms of culture, now in terms of the orientation of the individual to social forces such as, you know, state power and wealth. So coming back to the text, Hegel says that um, we find that in the face of the frank and self-conscious eloquence of the educated mind, the educated mind, the cultured, the, you know, you might say built up mind, uh, which is, you know, building is building on yourself. He says uh, it, it has a frankness. It has a self-conscious eloquence. Even if it knows that it doesn't have the solution to everything, it can at least say, well, here's what the situation looks like. You know? And if we want contemporary examples, pick any, uh, any, any issue in our modern culture and start picking it apart and looking at it in a careful way. You know, don't be the... Uh, one-sided, straightforward consciousness about it, be nuanced. Look at it in its, in its multiple senses and see that even when good is being done, there's also some bad lurking in the background and that good has to be done in response to bad or the rational develops out of the irrational and then opposes it. And we can go on and on and on with this. What's opposed to that? So self-conscious eloquence over here. Here's where it gets really interesting. And it's, again, he's talking about language. This uh, straightforward consciousness, the, the simple 
consciousness. He says it, it can be no more than taciturn. And what is taciturn? It, it doesn't say all that much. It shuts up a lot of the time. He says to the latter, it can say nothing it does not already know and say. When this is trying to speak to this, it, can, it, it can't tell it anything fundamentally new. We have this experience, it's quite interesting as professors, when we have indoctrinated students from left and right, you know, you know, you might say foot soldiers in the culture wars coming into our classrooms and telling us about how it is. And we're like, buddy, I knew that 20 years ago. I already thought that thought. And I thought it out further than you did. And here's where that thought actually leads to. We appear jaded to them. They then become taciturn. They're like, oh, I guess I should just shut up. There's nothing else to say. So he says, if it gets beyond speaking in monosyllables, it says the same thing that is said to the educated, by the educated mind, but it commits a folly. It commits a foolishness, a tutorheit, being, being crazy in, in some respects, of imagining that it's saying something new and different. Now, notice what Hegel says after this. It uses words like shameful and ignoble, and he says that's already part of its folly. This is where we have people, whether they're young people or old people, discovering a cause, discovering a key that unlocks the story of the culture of the world or the culture of the West or the culture of the present moment, and applying that in a cookie-cutter fashion to everything that is. You know, these are the good people, these are the bad people, because they're part of this narrative and they're part of this narrative. I'll use an example that I run across quite frequently in philosophy. The whole world is Platonists and Aristotelians, so we just got to figure out who lines up where and which one is the good one, right? Um, so probably the Aristotelians, because they're, they're more empirical, right? Well, that's if you read crappy histories of philosophy <laughs> or histories of ideas or even stuff that's not quite at that level. Uh, only by that would you say that, that Aristotle is an empiricist, right? There are certainly empiricism elements to Aristotle's philosophy, but there's, there's far more than that. And then, you know, they, they start doing, a, you know, pasting it onto things. Where do we put the contemporary Stoics? Are, are they Aristotelians or Platonists? Now, the, the correct answer is, Hey, buddy, they're neither. They don't fit into that nice, you know, checkerboard that you want to place everything onto. But these people do it. And why do they do it? You might say, well, it's a desire for certainty based in, you know, whatever psychological needs they have. And that is correct in some cases. In other cases, it's because there's an adventure involved. When you have a key like that, you know, this happens to people when they read Nietzsche for the first time. Wow, I understand the whole world is masters and slaves, and I'm going to be one of those ubermenschen. I'm not going to be one of those herd morality people, you know, and they start diagnosing it everywhere. You're a herd moralist, you know. Uh, then everyone looks at you, you're, you're, what? What are you talking about? There's an adventure. There's an excitement that's involved in doing that, particularly when you hook up with a few other people who talk the same language as you and you get down uh, you know, into to those sorts of things and talk about it over coffee or beer or whatever it is that you're going you're gonna to have. Um, but it doesn't go anywhere, Hegel's saying. He says this is foolishness. He says that this latter mind perverts in its speech all that is unequivocal, because what is self-identical is only an abstraction. Things that are self-identical, tautologies, are just abstractions. They don't really help us out with anything. And this is the, the problem with all of these, you might say, pasteboard, uh, you know, poster session, uh, you know, takes on, on reality. He goes on and he says, it's actual, in its actual existence, it is in its own self a perversion. When we're grasping realities as such, particularly when we're engaged with ideas and persons or movements or events. They're always way more complicated. That's, the way, that's why the self-aware consciousness is talking about things the way that they are. They would love if things were simple, but they aren't. So we go on a little bit further. He says, the plain mind... And here he's using this term gerada. That's what's being translated as plain. You know, when you, when you have to go straight, the straight mind... We might say, this is the straight, this is the crooked, right? Or this is the straight, and this is the complex. 
Um, the plain mind, on the other hand, takes under its protection the good and the noble, the edel. What retains its self-identity in its essence, in its utterance, in the only way here possible. What's the only way here possible? The good does not lose its value because it may be associated or mixed with the bad, for this is its condition and necessity. So here's a little bit of sophistication on this part, a little bit of advance. We're going to say, all right, I understand that the good isn't completely wholly good, but at least we've got the good and that little bit of evil that might be associated with it or that you know, little bit of ignobility in the noble is actually kind of you know, enhancing it and bringing it out. Hegel says, well, that, that's a nice thing to say, but it's really not going to work as a strategy. So he says, uh, this plain mind, while it imagined it was contradicting what was said over here, has in doing so merely condensed into a trivial form the content of spirit's utterance. Spirit is on this side. And again, this is where the students come to us and they say, ah, I've realized that this is the case. And you're like, yeah, sorry. Uh, I know you think that's an original thought and you think that's really important that you have like said something that encapsulated all of the reality, and you have made an advance. You're no longer just, you know, dinning good, 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 good over and over again. But this is not something really that new, nor is it really that complicated. But good for you. You're, you're, you're getting there. So Hegel goes on and he says, in making the opposite of the noble and good into the condition and necessity of the noble and good, then you need a sort of contrast. You need a sort of dynamic of, of these things uh, you know, being in tension with each other. It thoughtlessly supposes itself to be saying something else than what it is called, than, than that wit, what is called noble and good is in its essence the reverse of itself, or that conversely the bad is the excellent. It's still trying to hold on to these and saying things like, well, you can't have the good without the bad, or if we didn't have evil in the world, we wouldn't know that good existed, or, you know, ignoble people allow the noble person to, you know, stand out. Uh, we don't say noble, we say excellent, or we say flourishing, or we say all sorts of things like that. We talk about them as leaders, right? The leadership literature is actually kind of full of <laughs> this sort of thing. Um, Hegel thinks that the, the weight of culture is really on this side. And notice that I put self-aware consciousness of culture. It's not only aware of the, the nature of the world and what it's caught in. It's also aware, although Hegel doesn't spell this out at this point, of this dynamic between these two types of consciousness here. And it, it, it's not necessarily happy about that any more than the skeptic in the skepticism section was happy about being caught in the toils of that mental morass. So where will we go from here? We have to look ahead to the next several paragraphs. If the simple consciousness compensates for this dull, uninspired thought by the actuality of the excellent by adducing an example of the latter, either in the form of a fictitious case or a true story, thus showing that it is no empty name but actually exists, the universal actuality of the perverted action stands opposed to the whole of the real world in which the said example constitutes something quite single and separate, an espèce, a mere sort of thing, and to represent the existence of the good and the noble as an isolated anecdote, whether fictitious or true, is the most disparaging thing that can be said about it. Finally, should the plain mind demand the dissolution of this whole world of perversion, it cannot demand of the individual that he remove himself from it. For even Diogenes in his tub is conditioned by it, and to make this demand of the individual is just what is reckoned to be bad, that is, to care for himself qua individual. But if the demand for this removal is directed to the universal individuality, it cannot mean that reason should give up, again, the spiritually developed consciousness it has acquired, should submerge the widespread wealth of its moments again in the simplicity of the natural heart, and relapse into the wilderness of the nearly animal consciousness, which is also called nature or innocence. On the contrary, the demand for this dissolution can only be directed to the spirit of culture itself, in order that it return out of its confusion to itself as spirit and win for itself a still higher consciousness.
Paragraph 524 represents a very important turning point in, in this dialectic, and we're getting very close to the end of the section. We'll, we'll come back to that in just a moment, but what I want to say first is what's happening is this, this straightforward or simple Einfach consciousness is attempting to do two little tricks, you might say, or dodges. The, and it's doing this in order to try to have what it is that it, it's looking for, the true, the good, the, the rational, the noble. And we might say, you know, reading into this, by doing so, to have something that it can hold for itself and recognize itself. And Hegel is not using the term honor can, honor here, you know, for recognition. But um, I think that's part of what, what's happening at this point. Now, the, both of these are going to fail. Both of these dodges or tricks or strategies, if you like, are going to fail for uh, good reasons, as we're going to see in the paragraphs yet to come. But let, let's see where he actually ends this, this paragraph. So he tells us that um, there's a demand, and this is part of the second strategy, the demand for a kind of dissolution, um, but not just a dissolution, a restoration, can only be directed, he says, to the spirit, but not just spirit geist in general, the spirit of culture, the spirit that's ruling the world at this stage, in order that it return out of its confusion to itself as spirit and win for itself a still higher consciousness. So the way forward is not to try to go back, and it's not to try to simplify. It's to go through the valley, to walk across the threshold, to you know make your way through the gauntlet, to take the blows, and to somehow come out on the other side. The simple consciousness is trying to avoid this at first. And it's simply not going to work. But it's interesting because, you know, as I mentioned, we can still see this dynamic playing itself out in our culture in the present. And both of these are done just as much as what was talked about in the previous paragraph. Uh, the, these sorts of uh, resorts are routinely engaged in. So let's, let's see how Hegel describes it. So we've got the, the simple consciousness, and it, it, it creates a kind of narrative. It tells a kind of story. As Hegel says that the simple consciousness is going to try to talk about the actuality, the reality of the excellent, and it's going to bring about an example of, of the excellent. So he says, either in the, case, the form of a fictitious case, like it writes a novel or makes a movie. This is often a kind of idealization. You know, so what we have are people who are, are not happy with the, the, the morass of culture that we live in tell a story in which there's good guys and bad guys. And again, this happens on both left and right. Um, this happens with people who think of themselves as very sophisticated but are actually very simple-minded about where our culture is. We have you know, what you might call culture warriors uh, coming in from all sides telling nice, simple stories about who wears the white hats and black hats, even if they reverse it so that you know, it's no longer white hats and black hats, but the black hats are the good guys and the white hats are the bad guys, or a rainbow hat, or wearing no hat at all makes you a good person, or wearing 15 different kinds of hats, it's still, still the same white hat, black hat story. So fictitious examples, right, are, are one case. Or trying to find a true story, which then usually has to be simplified, has to have its edges shaved off, has to have some of the, the loose ends tied up so that it will fit the nice narrative. So he says, what is the, the aim here? To show that it is no empty name, but actually exists. The true exists. The noble exists. The good exists. And then he says, the universal actuality of the perverted action stands opposed to the whole of the real world in which this said example constitutes something quite single and separate. Here Hegel uses this French term, an espèce. Um, you know, this is translatable as species, but it really means, like he says, a mere sort of thing. 
you know. When you say, you know, um, an espeste automobile, um, it's not a very good car, you know, espeste voiture, you know, espeste char, depending on how, what, what dialect you're talking about, right? Um, to, to make something into an individual like that doesn't accomplish what the person was trying to do because the whole reason they created a narrative is to say this one can stand in place for many others. But the reduction then just to the individual, you know, you look at, oh, I'm going to read this, this story about this heroism and bravery that's being displayed by, uh, you know, a, a infantryman who never questions uh, what's going on over there or questions just to the right extent in the war. Um, and you think to yourself, well, that's a really great story. And then while you're sort of captivated by the imagery and all that, you're like, yeah, wow, great. And then you think, how the hell is that supposed to apply to me and this screwed up world of culture that I live in? Should I just like withdraw into a fandom of this sort of thing? Live in my little tiny, you know, whatever cave it's going to be. If I'm going to be out there in the world and I try to communicate in these terms and I say, oh man, I saw this movie and it was about this guy or I read this book and he was so, you know, he was so heroic and people are like, that's all BS, man. Don't you understand that that's like, you know, essentially propaganda? And you're like, wait a second. You know, you're not, con you're not actually doing anything to the world. You're just sort of going into your own little cubbyhole if you do that sort of thing. So he's, he, he, Hegel talks about this, you know, the, the perverted action, uh, the action that actually shows that it's not just entirely noble, entirely good. Um, so he says, to represent the existence of the good and noble as an isolate, isolated anecdote, whether fictitious or true, is the most disparaging thing that can be said about it. Isn't that an interesting thing to say? Now, Hegel's not knocking random acts of kindness or any sort of thing like that, or your post about the guy who saved the puppy out of the floodwaters or anything along those lines. What he's knocking is the idea that somehow this makes a difference in the world of culture that we live in, that it isn't simply a commodity thing to make you feel good for a little bit of time as if, well, the, look, there's, there's true nobility. I mean, think about this, you know, we just had an interesting example with this, this firefighter who everyone thought was so, so great and women were swooning because he's so hot. And then it turns out, you know, look in the social media, he's a neo-Nazi. And we can do this with case after case after case after case. You think anybody is, is you know, truly wonderful the way their bio says? Follow them around for about a day or two and, and watch the varnish come off. And that's okay. Hegel's not saying that, you know, oh, this just means we need to put the varnish on even, even better. He's saying, look, this is, this is the world we live in. This is what culture is. The way through it is to go further somehow and to come out on the other side. So let's talk about the second big dodge. It says, maybe the plain mind demands the dissolution of this whole world of perversion. Uh, now, how is that going to happen? We'll just tear it all down and start anew. People try this, don't they? These attempts always fail because they bring the world with them. This goes back, you know, this reminds me of something in monastic literature. Uh, John Cassian, of whom I'm a great fan, of, and of whom actually St. Benedict was such a great fan that he recommended Benedictines, who were you know, really the most important monastic order in the early Middle Ages, uh, should read him. He talks about uh, monks who think that by going off to the desert and being in isolation, they're going to get over, and he's specifically talking about their anger problems. You know, and he says, you're going to bring the entire world with you no matter where you go. You're not fleeing the world. You are just bringing it alongside you. And if you're not going to have any human beings to get mad at, you're going to get mad at your text. You're going to get mad at your, your pen. You're going to get mad at your sleeping mat. You're going to get mad at the wind for blowing on you. And we can say this about everything else. The person who tries to say, oh, we're just going to, we're going to get away from all of it. Um, no, they bring civilization with them. Certain aspects of it at least so what can we do <clears throat> hegel talks about the simple consciousness demands that the individual remove himself from it and then he says 
that doesn't work. Even Diogenes in his tub. Diogenes was, you know, the second in the, the cynic school. Antisthenes founds it. And Diogenes is very famous for the sort of self-imposed uh, hardships that he would go through. He lived in a barrel, a tub. <clears throat> he uh, would embrace statues. He, he also broke with social conventions in very funny and interesting ways. He probably would be a stand-up comic today, um, but probably a, a, a dirty, unwashed one <laughs> if he were around today. And of course, he wouldn't, he wouldn't hold any job for very long. The individual still is formed by the culture. Diogenes is not as free as he pretends to be, as he's tweaking everybody's noses. Neither is the stand-up comic who, you know, anything goes for them. I mean, to begin with, it's never the case that anything goes. We make jokes about that. You know, we, these anything goes types, uh, you do the things that they are doing to other people to them, and suddenly, oh, oh, you know, that's not good. Or a great example of this is the fact that everybody now, nowadays calls each other snowflakes. Started out as a conservative versus liberal thing, but now it turns out that, that conservatives are just as touchy and irritable and, you know, uh, unable to sustain themselves as individuals, rugged individuals, as the liberals who they are criticizing. They're all snowflakes, right? So if the individual isn't going to work, what if we direct this to a universal individuality? This is interesting. This is demanding that the society itself change and go back. So he says, uh, Hegel, Hegel says, this, it cannot mean reason should give up the spiritually developed consciousness that it has acquired. That was an advance. We don't want to go backwards. He says, it shouldn't submerge the widespread wealth of its moments into the simplicity of the natural heart and relapse into the wilderness of the nearly animal consciousness, which is also called nature or innocence. And this was a very common motif in Hegel's time, this notion that if we could just get back to the original people, we wouldn't all be such jerks to each other. It's culture that's corrupted us. It's culture that's made us you know, so acquisitive and exploitative and filled us with resentment and you know, brought about all these unequal power relations. Man, if we could just like find an island and you know, live an idyllic life there. Hegel's, Hegel's one of the first people who'd say, you know, looking ahead. Hey, did you ever, you ever read that book, The Lord of the Flies? Maybe islands aren't always the best thing, right? Um, Hegel says, you know, on the contrary, this is where we began, the, the demand for this dissolution, if you want to try to bring about a new world, you've got to do it by addressing this demand to, to spirit itself, the spirit of culture, that somehow it transform itself. It's not going to happen through the individual or the, some sort of universal withdrawing itself. It's not going to happen by telling interesting stories. It's going to happen, happen within the spirit of culture itself.